So Apple went and put an M1 chip into the iPad and then didn't release anything special to support it at WWDC. No pro apps, no special pro version of iPadOS with special features. And that's upset a few people. And now we have various tech influencers claiming that the M1 was always going to be an iPad chip. In fact, they say it's nothing more than an A14X, which has been rebadged and stuffed into the Mac. Many lols are being shared by PC fanboys in the comments sections on social media. They're highly amused that M1 Mac owners supposedly have this lowly iPad chip in their new Mac. Of course, conveniently forgetting that even the lowly iPad chip is faster than the majority of x86 laptops. Uh, but is this claim true? Did Apple make an enhanced version of the A14 for the iPad Pro and then decide to put it in all the new Macs? Let's start at the beginning, which is long before the WWDC keynote last year, where Apple first announced the Mac Silicon transition. Companies like Apple plan things out pretty carefully. That doesn't mean they always get it right, of course, but things at Apple don't happen by accident. I can't believe that it's the case that the Silicon team came up with a great new iPad chip, took it upstairs to Tim Cook, and then he decided on a whim to just ditch Intel and put this chip in all their new Macs. Now, surely Apple have been planning to move away from Intel for years. Uh, by all accounts, the relationship hasn't been great, particularly in recent years as Intel has struggled with its new fabrication processes. Uh, something else to think about is that there isn't much to differentiate Apple's Intel machines with PCs, other than the enormous premium that Apple charges once you go beyond the base models in the lineup. So Apple moving its Macs over to its own silicon is a very tempting business proposition. Fortunately, Apple's CPU team started its work more than a decade ago, progressively working on ARM designs to build better and better CPU cores. And the iPad and iPhones have been an excellent testbed for that development. And bear in mind that iOS is built on the foundations of macOS, so building a great iPad chip is ideal groundwork for future Mac chips. Later in 2017, Apple started to develop its own GPU cores too, uh, ditching imagination technologies power VR. Well, sort of. Uh, in the same way that Apple has taken ARM and developed the technology further for its own CPU cores, it seems to have taken PowerVR and done the same thing for GPU, uh, somewhat controversially in this case. Uh, Apple poached some of Imagination's engineers and reduced what it was paying, causing Imagination Technologies a bit of bother. Uh, we won't go into any detail here in this video, but apparently now things have mostly been sorted out and Apple pays license fees for Imagination's intellectual property. Uh, but it has taken that GPU design on somewhat. So we've got great CPU cores and some great GPU cores, and lots of clever engineers around to make things work. Add in Apple's purchase of the company Anobit for $500 million back in 2011, and you also have a team of world-class flash memory engineers on board. And that's pretty useful when your silicon relies heavily on flash SSD storage. So these new silicon designs are not accidental overnight successes. Uh, this has been a long period of careful research and development, including having chips out there in the wild being actively used in devices by consumers. Apple was never going to undertake a transition like this without years of research and planning to ensure it would be successful and to ensure that it would increase the stock price rather than decimate it. Apple Silicon is a system on chip. In other words, it's pretty much an entire computer built onto a single piece of silicon. And that's important to remember, because the CPU and GPU cores we've been talking about and that SSD controller, well, they're all just components or building blocks which Apple can use to build its chips. When developing the M1, Apple made use of the same CPU and GPU cores that feature in the A14 iPad chip. But that doesn't mean that the M1 is an A14 or A14X. It's similar to how car manufacturers might use the same engine across multiple models. It's often the other components that make the big difference. Uh, for example, you could take the engine from a family sedan and put it into a four-wheel drive off-road vehicle. And the two vehicles you end up with will be very different, even though they share an engine. And it's the same story with the M1. Apple has added things to the M1 silicon that make it really useful for a Mac. And whilst iOS and macOS may share common underpinnings, the way that the two operating systems manage memory and multitasking is different. 
and the way that users expect to interact with those operating systems is different. So the chip designs need to accommodate that. The M1 is physically quite a bit larger than the A14. Uh, there are additional cores on board, which are running at a slightly higher clock frequency. The cache memory serving those cores has been increased, and there are double the number of DDR memory interfaces. Uh, that's because Macs need more RAM than iPads do, because of those differences in the operating systems and the way they handle multitasking. And the T2 chip, which handles security, touch ID, storage encryption, and even image signal processing on Intel Macs, has now been incorporated into that M1 system on chip. The Mac and the iPad, well, they have different connectivity requirements. So M1 has Apple's own Thunderbolt controller and enough PCI Express lanes for it to work effectively. And the M1 also introduces support for Apple's hypervisor framework. And this is necessary for virtualization which is hugely important for many macOS users. It enables the use of virtual machines, which may mean nothing at all to you, but it's a pretty essential feature for software and web developers. And of course, it's something that Intel CPUs are very good at. So it's very important that Apple built that functionality into the M1. The iPad, on the other hand, doesn't need that functionality. You might remember that last year, Apple provided a developer transition kit essentially a Mac mini with an A12Z or Z iPad chip in it. So yes, iPad chips can run Mac OS, but that developer machine lacks support for things like virtualization. Developers had to wait for the release of M1 for that. So what do we make of these claims? Is the M1 actually this mythical A14X chip in disguise? Uh, are Apple Silicon Macs running mobile chips that were originally designed for iPads? I think to assume that would be a gross oversimplification of a long research and development journey. Yes, the M1 does use the same common building blocks as the A14, but it adds a considerable amount of Mac-specific additions to create a system on chip that works really well with the Mac. And it's a low power system on chip because it comes from those ARM and PowerVR designs. Uh, these designs are used in mobile devices because low power draw and long battery life are the things that we want from mobile. Does that make these lesser chips in some way? Well, the performance data shows that these chips have got some serious computing power, offering single core speeds which are only rivaled by the most expensive chips from AMD and Intel, and multi-core performance which exceeds everything Intel has on offer for mobile devices. And it does all of this with significantly less power draw. And that's why we've got these amazing new laptops from Apple that don't even have fans in them. But I think these chips work really well for desktop too. Think about the future possibilities. The physical size of the silicon can be scaled up considerably and still offer better thermal performance and less power draw than the x86 equivalents. It's one of the reasons why companies like Amazon have developed their own ARM CPUs for use in their data centers. And they're not alone. ARM has really come of age and comments about the M1 being just a, a mobile chip or just an iPad chip rather smell of the malodorous whiff of sore fanboy, uh, particularly when the A12 iPad chips even outperform a lot of x86 systems. This whole argument has surfaced because Apple put the M1 chip in the latest iPad Pro, causing some to claim that it was always destined for the iPad and must therefore be the A14X. I'm deploying the air quotes a lot here because Apple has never released or mentioned the term A14X. In any case, there are other reasons for Apple to put the M1 in the iPad. And no, I don't think the iPad is going to run Mac OS at some point. Uh, if you think about that logically from a business perspective, um, that's Apple's profit-hungry business perspective, you'd see that that's not really going to happen. I'd love to have an iPad that can be docked and switched to Mac OS, and I'm sure lots of people would like that, but with Apple, it's not about what the consumer wants. It's about what Apple wants the consumer to want. And that goal will always be fully aligned with Apple making maximum profit. Putting the M1 into the iPad saves a huge amount of cost. Never mind that the iPad can't use some of the M1's Mac specific features, or that it can't tap into the huge performance potential, because it's still a very fast iPad at a similar price point to the previous model. So anyone who's buying the iPad expecting an iPad will be delighted. If you're buying the iPad, however, expecting something else, then you may be disappointed. 
Now, I'll be honest and say that I was hoping that Apple had intentions of making better use of the M1 in the iPad. Uh, so the announcements of iPadOS 15 and its new widgets from WWDC, well, that didn't exactly fill me with excitement. And it seems that's the case for many of you too. A good proportion of people have been saying that they're going to return their M1 iPads. In fairness though, Apple never promised that the M1 iPad would receive any special software. It seems logical that they might bring Pro apps like Final Cut Pro and Logic to the iPad platform. And they still might. There's a lot of time until iPadOS 15 actually launches. And there could be further announcements on that. But don't go out and buy the M1 iPad based on that expectation. And it seems on social media and YouTube as well, there's a, a huge amount of misinformation doing the rounds. Uh, it seems that every tech channel is claiming some special secret insight into Apple's plans, or they're reading way too much into every detail of everything Apple does. Uh, Apple's always been tight-lipped and secretive about new product launches, so most of the rumour mill is nothing more than pure guesswork, or perhaps even sensationalism to drum up clicks, views and advertising revenue. These guys have to make a living after all. Uh, I don't personally make a living from YouTube, uh, far from it, and I'm thankful for that. And I don't have any special inside knowledge either, other than some common sense business logic and tech knowledge that I've built up over a career as a developer for the past 25 years. I expected that Apple would release more hardware and information about the development of the M chips at WWDC. And yes, I know it's a software event and Apple doesn't often release hardware at WWDC. But this is a huge transition now at its halfway point, and it's entirely dependent on developer support. Honestly, I think it's a little bit weird that Apple didn't even mention it at all. Uh, but that's another topic for another video. So if you've bought an M1 Mac, you should enjoy it. The M1 is a fantastic chip built for your Mac. And if you've got an M1 iPad Pro, well, you should enjoy that too. It's a great iPad, even if you can't tap all of the performance of that M1. And let's face it, you probably never would have used all of that performance anyway. If it's sold at the same price as the previous model and it's faster, should we really be worried about it? Who knows what will come in the future, but we do know that Apple's huge team of engineers won't be sitting idle. The announcements and the product launches will inevitably happen, and the YouTubers and tech media will have to keep on guessing. I hope you enjoyed this video or found it informative in some way. If so, perhaps you could show some love by subscribing to the channel or maybe hitting the thumbs up button. Or not, but in any case, I hope to see you again soon for some more geekery.